All right, welcome to a quick review of the epidemiological transition. Uh, I'm Ms. Gall and I'll be your host for the afternoon. <clears throat> so some basic information about the epidemiological transition model. First thing you got to understand is that it's based in part on the demographic transition model. So there's a lot of similarities between the two. For instance, both have four stages with a proposed fifth stage. Um, both look at change across time and seek to explain why you see changes in at different times in different regions. So there's that where piece that we're always looking for in geography. Um, specifically, the uh, epidemiological transition model seeks to explain the changes that we see in life expectancies and the causes of death at various stages. It does focus largely almost entirely on health related factors and just like the demographic transition model, we're still going to be tracing development and we're still going to be talking about levels of development and how that impacts what's going on. Okay, so our stage one. Stage one, this is really um, pestilence and famine. Okay, so these are diseases that spread quickly through a population, oftentimes because that population is otherwise weakened. Uh, a lot of times these are pandemic diseases, like for instance, the Black Plague that swept through Europe's to such large devastation, particularly during the Middle Ages. And if you're not familiar, um, the statistics show anywhere from roughly a third to half of Europe as dying as a result of the Black Plague within roughly a two to three generation period. It was very quick, it was very sudden, and it was very, very deadly. Um, you also see a lot of deaths related to famine and not getting enough nutrition uh, in stage one countries. There's not really any stage one countries when we're talking about pestilence and famine. You could make an argument potentially for Haiti, particularly in the wake of the earthquake, or for areas that um, do have some of those major problems uh, in terms of um, physical or natural disasters and things like that, but really um, it's a little bit of a stretch for the most part to say anybody's still in stage one. Stage two, now we've got our pandemics, they're receding, people are getting healthier, um, the diseases are spreading less. A lot of times that's actually a direct result of improvements in the public health system. And public health, again, if you don't remember from before, just are those measures that the government takes to help ensure that everybody stays healthy. Um, there are things like making sure that you've got a clean source of water, making sure that uh, trash and waste products don't wind up just in the street, but that they actually go away somewhere. Um, and one of the ways, especially these days, that you really see see um, countries in stage two cleaning up their act, for lack of a better term, is the increasing use of data. And this is actually a huge subfield of geography, is, is medical geography, where you track cases of a given illness and then you uh, plug them into a map so that you can try and trace back to either the originator of the illness or the source of the illness or um, you can track which way an illness is moving. And a um, great example of this for our purposes, and actually this is the one out of your book, is um, the, the illness of cholera and, and the work of Dr. John Snow in London in order to isolate really where are those, what's the most likely source of those cholera cases. So when you look at the map there, you've got water pumps in blue and then you've got cholera victims in red and what you can see is what's essentially a functional region with that pump at Broad Street and sorry I can't quite read the other one but anyways at that corner there where the pump is the node and there's lots of cases near it and the further away you get the fewer cases you get which just went to um, prove Dr. Snow's point about water being the likely transmitter for cholera, and indeed it turns out to be to be correct. Okay, stage two countries, by the way, these are by and large our our less developed countries. Um, 
But even there, for the most part, this is not very much of an issue. Um, it becomes an issue in cases of nat nat natural disaster when there's just not the infrastructure built in, in or built up in such a way that um, a hit to some of the infrastructure doesn't mean a hit to all of the infrastructure. So stage three and stage four countries really both deal with degenerative diseases. And these are our developing and our more developed countries. Um, degenerative diseases are essentially diseases of old age. So these are ones that you can live with for a long time. They're ones that uh, result from and increase the wear and tear on your body. Things like heart disease, like cancer, um, and as medical care gets better and better, what you find is the ability to uh, prolong life and to make it easier to live with those degenerative diseases and easier to live for longer. So that um, what you see is actually an increased likelihood of surviving, say, a heart, uh, a first heart attack or a bout with cancer. Um, which becomes interesting when you start looking at genetics and the, the possibility of passing on some of the genes that may make people more likely to suffer from some of those. So there's some definite um, definite questions surrounding that. We're talking about the, uh, not the philosophy, what's the word I'm looking for? The ethics of some of the research and things like that. Stage five, and again, just like with the demographic transition model, it's a proposed stage five. Okay, it's a possible stage five. And what's really interesting is that what we're seeing in some areas is a reemergence of infectious diseases. And there's a lot of reasons why infectious diseases could be reemerging. Um, could be that the the diseases that have caused them have evolved in such a way that they no longer respond to uh, Antibiotics, um, poverty, oftentimes there's a lot of areas where um, you see increasing poverty and or sudden poverty and that plays a role in infectious diseases and this is a great example. I know I keep kind of going back to Haiti but that the cholera infections there. Um, you could draw some similar examples with Louisiana at, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina where all of a sudden you start to see infectious diseases go up as access to clean water and other resources goes away. Um, improved travel is a huge piece of this and we see this with things like the SARS outbreak a number of years ago and I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember that or not but essentially what happened is you had a person who got sick hopped on an airplane from um, Asia and, hop and came over to Canada and while they're on the airplane they infect basically everybody on the airplane. So that's a huge reason why infectious diseases are reemerging, and part of this debate as well as the debate that you get over um, whether or not people should uh, vaccinate their children, right? Because vaccinating only works if most people get it, because then those people who can't get it for whatever reason, maybe they have a, a religious objection or maybe they have problems with their immune system, they basically benefit from what they call as the, the herd immunity, right? If everybody around them is immune and isn't going to get it, then those people become significantly less likely to get it as well. So this has been our lecture on the epidemiological transition model, and I hope that, uh, hope that it made sense to you. But if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to ask, and I'll see you in class.